cooler temperatures, then you are invited to go to the D building. Okay. Then I think we can start. I want to ask you to turn your mobile phones off or put into silence. And um, just the advice, once again, we have this application, this app. So people who are now in the D building, if you have any comment or question later, you can connect to the channel, look for the channel of this keynote and you can send your questions and comments. I will read them on my mobile phone later and uh, Ms. Asman will try to answer your questions. Okay, dear directors of the Memory Studies Association, dear Jenny Wüstenberg, dear Aline Sirp, who cannot be here tonight, dear Jeffrey Olick, dear Ms. Asman, dear colleagues, dear guests, it's a great honor to host this first keynote speech of this year's Memory Studies Association conference and thus to open the event. Well, as you all know, the official welcoming will be here tomorrow at 9 o'clock in the same place. Before introducing Alida Asman, I would like to thank the directors of the Memory Studies Association for entrusting us with the organization of this event. And we hope not to disappoint neither you <laughs> nor the expectations of all the participants who have come to Madrid. In any case, what has become clear already is that this year's conference has exceeded all expectations in terms of both the number of presentations and also the supporting program. The MSA conference is thus making an enormously important contribution to the development of this particular field of research. We have tried to do our best to meet the requirements that a conference of this magnitude imply and we hope that we'll all be happy with the outcome. That the MSA conference in Madrid could host such a number of attendees while counting on limited resources at the same time is mainly owed to my university, in particular to the Dean of the Faculty of Philology, Eugenio Lujan. Without his support and generosity, this conference would simply not have been possible. Both the Dean and the Administration Office of the Faculty have offered us unconditional support throughout the preparation period and I thank you for the excellent cooperation. At this point, I would also like to mention the colleagues from the audiovisual department, you have seen them here on stage before, <laughs> who have always been on hand with help and advice and have spared no effort. My special thanks also go to my former colleagues from the Goethe Institute Madrid, represented by Mr. Reinhard Maivorm, the director of the institute. The Goethe Institute has taken on the travel expenses of Ms. Asman's visit to Madrid, and thanks to them, we are able to enjoy this opening keynote. 
We are very pleased that Ms. Asman will open the conference with her lecture, and it's a great honor for me to welcome you in my faculty this evening. When I was asked to moderate Ms. Asman's talk, I was honored and delighted, and at the same time I became, became aware of the challenge of presenting someone who everyone in the field knows very well. Who in this room does not know Elida Asman, one of the most important theorists in the field of memory studies, and who has not read or heard about her publications? So how do you introduce someone who is known for her monographs such as Erinnerungsräume, Remembrance Spaces, which became a standard work of memory studies years ago, at least in German-speaking areas, or through monographs and essays like Culture, Memory and Western Civilization, published in 2012, or Shadows of Trauma, Memory and the Politics of Post-War Identity, published in 2016. I would like to add a few more writings to the series, as already by their titles, it becomes evident how aware Alida Asman is of her social responsibility as a scientist in all her research projects, and which is of fundamental importance for our field, maybe even more than in some others. These publications include Memory and Political Change, also from 2012, Human Rights and Human Responsibilities, Keywords for Human Society, which is published only in German last year, and or is, is the time out of joint on the rise and fall of the modern time regime, which has been published this year in English, but before 2013 already in German. This to mention only a few more from the extremely extensive set of writings by Ms. Asman. Together with her husband, the Egyptologist Jan Asman, she has influenced and shaped the development and theoretical basic science of memory studies like no other and is consulted worldwide by researchers and experts in this field who take her ideas for practical application as well as a basis for further theoretical research. Her greatest merit is certainly to have developed the concept of collective memory forged by Maurice Obvax. Her findings and pioneering books on cultural memory a concept that refers also to suppression and forgetfulness, historical traumas and the reappraisal, not only of the recent past, but also of earlier high cultures, have undoubtedly shaped the field. After all, Ms. Asman is not only well known by professionals of memory studies, but also by a much wider audience, and not just since she and her husband were awarded the Peace Prize of the German book trade. Even before, they were already present in the media and had gained a reputation that goes far beyond the academic field. It is certainly one of her greatest accomplishments to have made memory studies so popular and to have carried her research results out of the academic ivory tower and into society. Because all too soon, we forget who we should actually do this research for. I think I can rightly say that this kind of boundary has always been a dread to Elida Asman. Namely, in terms of the often criticized foreclosure of the academic world to society, but also in terms of the operational blindness of the different fields of study. So one could call what Elida Asman practices lived transdisciplinarity, or, to be more precise, freedom. The freedom of critical thinking. The fact that Elida Asman allows us to participate in her thinking is a great stroke of luck for all of us. It enlivens the scientific in social discourse. Not all scientists and intellectuals approve her ideas in their entirety, but I guess that is exactly what she is looking for, the vivid and productive debate. That is exactly the reason why I also hope for a lively debate tonight. But before this can take place, after Ms. Asman's lecture, I must once again return to my initial question and thus to my dilemma. How do you present a personality that is well known not only to an international specialist audience, but also beyond. I have dealt with this question in the last few weeks again and again, but unfortunately found no satisfactory answer and ultimately capitulated. Therefore, I decided that it is much better to simply say nothing more, but rather to let Ms. Asman speak for herself. After all, dear guests, you have not come to hear me speak, but to listen to Professor Asman. For this reason, I will give no floor to Ms. Asman, since we are all eagerly awaiting your presentation, Reimagining the, uh, the Nation, Memory, Identity and the Emotions, in which you will talk about the nationalist turn in the EU. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um,
um, Johanna, so much for this overly kind introduction. And this is exactly what I hope to do with you today to let you participate in the stream, in the process of my thinking. I hope you will follow me. But first of all, dear friends <coughs> and uh, scholars and supporters of memory studies, it is obviously an awesome moment that we are all here together. It is um, fantastic. <coughs> And of course, due to a couple of people who have worked day and night to make this event possible, I'm thanking Aline, Jenny, and Jeff, but also Johanna and the Madrid team, and I'm also including the Goethe Institute, who's also supporting this event here in Madrid. <clears throat> it is really a miracle that you are making uh, true for us here. And I am, uh, for me, it feels almost unreal that I am the one uh, who was asked to kick the whole thing off. And I'm, I'm very um, honored and <clears throat> happy to do so. I will do something, namely bring back the concept of memory, uh, of nation back to memory studies. Can you hear me? Also when I look down, do you also hear me? Okay. Within the framework of modernization theory, the nation was considered to be a transitory stage on the way to larger cosmopolitan units, for instance, such a unit as world society. This evolution was supposed to be driven by the force of globalization that was expected to eventually dissolve national borders and replace them by strong links of interdependence in an unbounded market economy. Modernization theorists, technocrats, managers, but also leftists and cosmopolitans shared a view of history in which the concept of nation was rendered obsolete. But also in memory studies, the nation was treated with suspicion. The term methodological nationalism was created as a deterrent from engaging with this concept. The reason is clear. Any engagement with the nation was suspected to wittingly or unwittingly promote nationalism. When a few days ago at the Kirchentag in Dortmund, where I'm just coming from, Heribert Prantl, the editor of the Süddeutsche Zeitung, gave a galvanizing speech and was asked afterwards how to deal with the concept of the nation, his answer was quick, clear, short, and expectable. He said, zero tolerance for nationalism and extremism. But don't we all live in nations? As far as I can see, there is as yet no real alternative for the nation. Nations, of course, do not exist in a void. They exist in states that can be either liberal democracies or autocratic regimes. Today, the principles of liberal democracy are challenged in Europe and elsewhere. We are experiencing a strong pull by right-wing parties that systematically dismantle democratic structures and openly promote illiberal transformations. Tabooing and abandoning the concept of the nation by the left may even have contributed to empower the right, who, is, who has, in the meantime, answered the trend towards pluralization with polarization. While pluralization had been backed up by the social utopia, polarization is now backed up by spite, resentment, and outright hatred. Polit political ideologies have given way to identity politics and collective emotions as the driving force of politics. This is a wake-up call for memory studies. <clears throat> for more than a decade, we emphatically opted for transnational memories. I definitely include myself in this perspective. Our normative emphasis was progressive, leftist, and cosmopolitan. In studying and recommending transnational memories, we had hoped that this would automatically strengthen them. In our liberal thinking, we have forgotten the nation, but illiberal thinkers and movements have not. 
Right-wing nationalists have returned. They are presenting themselves unashamedly and are emphatically steering political action in the EU today. Let me start with an example. In the mid-90s, the European Parliament decided to create a house of European history in Brussels. This project proved more difficult than expected. After 10 intensive years of brainstorming and preparations, the first team of experts gave up when they discovered that a unifying master narrative for Europe was not available. A second team was more successful. It chose a different approach that focused mainly on the 19th and 20th century, and here in particular on the history of European unification in a global context. It was designed to present European history as a transnational process, emphasizing the plurality of experiences and perspectives. The museum opened in 2016 and was praised for its multi-perspectival <coughs> approach and its reflexive forms of presentation. This remained the state of affairs until a group of Visegrad states undertook a collective trip to Brussels to visit the House of European History in August 2017. They were not at all pleased with what they saw and strongly objected to the whole concept of the museum because they could not find a reference to nations and nation states. What they held to be the most important and the most, in fact, the most sacred, namely their nation, proved to be totally absent from this museum. As they did not find themselves adequately represented, they strongly criticized the museum as a fraud and denigration of history. Polish Prime Minister Morawiecki had a simple explanation for the museum. Because of the conspicuous absence of references to nations, he argued, it presented a communist view. <laughs> For him, the EU is the revival of the Soviet Union, with the Poles once more in the position of the victim at the hands of an ideological enemy. The presentation is seen as an homage to the homo sovieticus, I quote, a man without nationalities in a homogeneous mass of identical nations. Such criticism obviously tells us more about prejudices and paranoia <clears throat> than about the real house of European history in Brussels. For these visitors, the museum works like a screen on which the undigested histories of European nations are projected. It shows how a history, <clears throat> it shows how a history that has not been worked through repeats itself. In the Polish view, Brussels is the new Moscow. There may indeed be historical memories, experiences and emotions involved here. In Germany, for instance, intellectuals dropped the concept of the nation for another very obvious reason that had to do with historical memory. During its Nazi period, the country had had an overdose of nationalism that had degenerated into the murderous regime of national socialism with the worst possible consequences for Europe and its Jews. In Poland, on the other hand, the historical experience taught the opposite lesson. Due to foreign invasion and occupation, the country had completely vanished from the map in previous times and when the Polish state was re-established after the First World War, underwent long periods of persecution, occupation, and foreign dominance during and after the Second World War. No wonder that the concept of the nation is estimated differently within the EU. While for some member states, such as Germany, it was a welcome invitation to leave the concept of the nation behind and to focus on the transnational level, of Europe. For others, however, like Poland, <clears throat> Europe became inversely the guarantor of the nation state and when this nation state was threatened by liberal values and immigration, Europe was turned into the enemy that endangered the survival of the nation. In a country like Germany, 
the continued indifference of intellectuals concerning the nation had detrimental effects. One negative consequence was that the extreme right had an easy chance to pick up the empty container of the nation to fill it with its own values, images, emotions, and promises. Another negative consequence is that a country without a, a clear self-image and a shared sense of its own nationhood or history has great difficulties to integrate new migrants. They have left something behind and expect not only shelter, but also a new homeland into which they are invited and introduced in order not only to share, but also to shape and transform their new nation by contributing their own experiences and competences. If the nation presents itself as an empty signifier, however, the call of the previous homeland <clears throat> will remain a normative instance and new bonds of loyalty are unlikely to develop. A shared identity is usually expressed in terms of national pride, but pride has been sidelined in Germany as a possible option for collective identification. Are there other positive options available that can serve as a robust source of common identification in a democratic and diverse society? And what role can memory play here? These are questions that deserve attention and investigation because in Europe the battle against migrants is vocally articulated by right-wing groups that are becoming more and more self-assertive supporting populist demands for easy solutions, strong borders, and reckless leaders. This new nationalism is ready to forego and forget lessons of history that had successfully domesticated and democratized the nations of the EU over the last 70 years. If the nation, however, is an important resource for integration, and integration is seen as a common project for both its citizens and its migrants, how can it be reimagined and supported <clears throat> to live up to this difficult and important task? In the course of my lecture, I will try <clears throat> to analyze these problems in the light of new and older concepts. And I start with Francis Fukuyama. <clears throat> Fukuyama had been a staunch modernization theorist who, after the demise of communism, had taken for granted that not only the nation, but also history would altogether disappear. Now, <clears throat> 30 years after his book, The End of History and the Last Man, Fukuyama sees a need to revise his premises. In his recent book, Identity, Contemporary Identity Politics and the Struggle for Recognition, 2018, he registers another global transformation and addresses the current crisis of the American nation. Its fund uh, foundational formula, e pluribus unum, out of many, one, <clears throat> seems less and less able to contain the multiplicity of self-assertive and self-centered groups that are giving up their emotional investment in a common nation and its liberal democracy. The social consensus is eroded, as he tells us, by identity politics, an ongoing struggle for social recognition. Like so many others, Fukuyama blurs the important distinction between individual and collective identity and generalizes them in the overly repeated formula of identity politics. Identities, he writes, can be and are incredibly varied based on nation, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or gender. They are all manifestations of a common phenomenon, that of identity politics. For Fukuyama, identity politics is driven by emotions. In this context, he introduces a new term that was absent from modernization theory so far, <clears throat> so that he now, <clears throat> and that he now presents as a new key to human motivations, namely, tumors. He found this term in the Greek dialogues of Plato. 
Timos is a severe blow to the idea of human behavior according to modernization theory as it overturns the rational choice descriptions of economists who had focused only on self-interest and narrow concerns for utility. Tumors is connected to the value and valor of the warrior and emphasizes male courage, enthusiasm, and patriotism, motivations that lead men to perform outstanding heroic feats of honor for the collective. Tumors, writes Fukuyama, is the seat of both anger and pride. pride. It is the seat of today's identity politics. From the very start, memory studies have been engaged with emotions, but it took a long time for philosophers, economists, historians, political scientists to recognize the role of collectives and the emotions as a vital part of human thinking, judging, acting, and decision-making. Decision Therefore, Fukuyama's introduction of the term tumors could be interesting and even promising as he uses <clears throat> but. But his shortcut from Plato to today's identity politics is highly problematic, as he uses tumors as a pass par two concept that levels all distinctions and bypasses historical contexts. In his definition, he raises the emphatically male tumors to a universal aspect of human personality that craves recognition. <clears throat> because the desire for recognition seems to lie within every human soul. Recognition thus becomes the overriding concept, including both megalotumia, namely craving for recognition <clears throat> for outstanding feats in the aristocratic warrior tradition, and isotumia, namely craving recognition in liberal democracies, where everyone is recognized as inherently equal. With the link between tumors and recognition, Fukuyama is confident that he has forged a key to unlock the problems of identity politics. Contemporary identity politics is driven by the quest for equal recognition by groups that have been marginalized by their societies. But that desire for equal recognition can easily slide over into a demand for recognition of the group's superiority. Fukuyama rightly criticizes <clears throat> in identity politics a tendency to create watertight boundaries around such groups that make it difficult to communicate, interact, and collaborate within a common <clears throat> uh, national or social framework. Here is an example. <clears throat> My son is a filmmaker <clears throat> who has edited a documentary about two black boxers from Chicago. Some white critics argued that he and the director were not entitled to engage in such a project because they did not have the right skin color, denouncing their work as cultural appropriation. They were greatly relieved, however, when after the, <coughs> when <coughs> after the film had premiered at the Berlinale this year, these voices disappeared and their artistic work of nine years with these boys was accepted and even praised. Acknowledging and respecting the lived experience of marginalized and victimized groups is one thing. Creating fences around them and sealing their experiences as untouchable, incomprehensible, and untranslatable for others is a problematic strategy that undermines communication, free speech, art, empathy, shared values, and joint projects. My criticism of Fukuyama's concept of tumors is that he conflates three historical traditions that have nothing whatsoever in common. Namely, number one, the Greek concept of tumors, as I already said, pointing to ancient Greece and an old aristocratic, virile warrior spirit. Secondly, the early modern concept of an autonomous inner self that goes back to the Reformation, print culture, and the rise of the individual. 
And thirdly, the concept of human dignity that goes back to the 18th century enlightenment and is the cornerstone of human rights. The Greek word tumos means anger, courage, and vigor. These emotions are part of an aristocratic warrior culture and they can be very well applied to individuals as well as to collectives, particularly to nations who use emotions like honor, shame, and pride, but also anger, rage, and resentment to mobilize masses and to enforce strong group cohesion. The recognition of an inner self, however, cannot be applied to collectives at all. On the contrary, it empowers the individual over against society and its institutions, such as the church or the state. Thirdly, in the case of the concept of human dignity, we are dealing with an ethical norm and a moral commitment to recognize a common human humanity that has to be protected in all humans individually, irrespective of race, status, nationality, and other group affiliations. The result of these conceptual slippages is that Fukuyama also conflates pride and dignity. But one is an emotion and the other is an ethical principle. While pride energizes and mobilizes individuals and national collectives, recognition of human rights and dignity is written into the foundation of democratic states and has become a standard and norm to measure civilized societies nations. To refer to both as forms of identity politics that equally disrupt the framework of a democratic society is therefore highly misleading. I pick up Fukuyama's tumors and with it emotions like pride, honor and resentment to apply them to a critical study of national memory. In sharp contrast from dignity that is intrinsically dialogic because it depends on the recognition by others, national pride depends only on the support and participation of the members of the collective. For this reason, Peter Sloterdijk has referred to national myths as auto-hypnotic. To gain a deeper insight into the structure of national memory, it is helpful to come back to Maurice Halbwax, who was already mentioned today, and his concept of the social frame. Like a picture frame, a memory frame includes something and excludes everything else. National memories are ruled by a simple logic of forgetting. In Paris, for instance, you will find metro stations commemorating Napoleon's victories, such as Jena or Austerlitz, but you will not find a metro station with the name Waterloo. In order, in order to enter this station, you have to go to London. <laughs> in other words, national memory com commemorates victories and forgets the defeats. The question of the frame is then what can, should be, and may be articulated and what should be bypassed and remain silent. What attracts interest and attention, what raises empathy, and what remains unspoken. These questions point to the emotions as motor and fuel of memories. While pride, craving recognition and, positive, and a positive self-image determine the selecting of memories, Emotions like guilt and shame are responsible for the exclusion and repression of memories. And nobody knew this better than Nietzsche, who wrote, Yes, I have done it, says my memory. No, I cannot have done it, says my pride and stays adamant. Finally, memory gives in. What is true for individuals is also true for groups. <clears throat> we remember and forget in order to belong and avoid and what might have an exclusionary effect. Social frames work like filters that organize the selection of memories and confirm their relevance for the individual. Whatever supports the identity of the group is remembered and the identity of the group 
<coughs> consolidates the memories of the individuals. In other words, the relation between identity and, and memories is circular. These frames subsist as long as they are needed, but they can easily collapse when contexts change and new identities emerge. All of this means that in national memory, history, more often than not, is carefully reduced to a respectable narrative. When facing a traumatic and guilty past, there were only three acceptable roles for the collective. That of the victor that has triumphed over evil, that of the resistor or martyr who has fought evil, and that of the passive victim who suffered evil. What remained outside the sanctioned roles could not enter the narrative and was, on an official level, forgotten. Mark Bloch, already back in the 1920s, criticized this auto-hypnotic, or as I call it, monological character of national memory. He said, let's stop talking forever from national history to national history without understanding each other. He called this conversation a dialogue between deaths, in which both give wrong answers to the question of the other. And here is Peter Novick, who said, collective memory simplifies. It sees everything from a single emotionally charged perspective. It can't bear ambivalences and reduces events to archetypes. After the end of the Cold War, however, a new format of national memory emerged in the EU as an absolute historic innovation. It also emphasizes positive events, but also expands the frame to assign a place also to the victims of one's own history. This dialogic memory, as I call it, <clears throat> was not imposed by politicians from above, but cre was created by civil societies and their demand for historical truth. When after 1989, hitherto sealed archives were suddenly accessible, archival documents, historical research, historical commissions, and the collection of oral testimonies significantly enlarged the scope of historical knowledge, challenging some firmly established national self-images and causing the revision of national narratives in the EU. Here again a few examples. New documents about Vichy on the one hand and the lack of awareness of the history of Jews in, the, in East Germany in the GDR put an end to the self-image of France or the GDR as pure resistor nations. After the scandals about the NS past of Austrian President Kurt Waldheim, or on another level, the information about Polish pogroms in Jedwabne or Kielce, Austria or Poland were no longer able to claim exclusively the status of the victim nation. And even the seemingly neutral Swiss were confronted with their own sites of memory in the shape of their banks and their borders. In contact with the crime of the Holocaust, national memories became more dialogic, in integrating also negative instances of their past into their national narratives. Since the 1990s, national memories no longer exist in isolation, but are tied together in the EU with other national memories across the borders. The Holocaust has become, a, become part of a global memory, the Second World War, part of a European memory. Richard Sennett has once remarked that it takes a plurality of contending memories in order to acknowledge uncomfortable historical facts. This explains why the constellation of the EU provided a unique frame for the transformation of monologic into dialogic memories. It is good that we exchange memories and learn what the others think of our stories. The whole of European history becomes increasingly a common stock, accessible to everyone without the constraints of national prejudice or other restrictions of bias. These words were spoken by Georgi Konrad in 2008. 
Eleven years later, the situation has again changed dramatically. We are experiencing a rollback of nationalism with a return of the old monologic patterns. After the opening of hitherto closed borders in the EU, we are now experiencing the erection of mental borders. And here I have another example. And this is the new museum of the Second World War that opened in March 2017 in Gdansk and was closed again after only two weeks. Huge museum, two weeks. It was initiated by Donald Tusk, who accepted with enthusiasm the plan of historian Pavel Makiewicz, who had drafted a sketch for a truly European museum of the Second World War. Tusk installed Makiewicz as the founding director, who worked for eight years together with a team of illustrious international experts. The museum presented the Second World War as an entangled European history in a dialogic framework, focusing on, national, on transnational relations, introducing different perspectives, honoring civil victims of war, and emphasizing pacifistic value. This, however, was not at all to the taste of Jaroslav Kaczynski's peace party. His plan is to replace the museum as soon as possible by another museum of the so-called of the Western Platte, the place where eight heroes resisted German aggression at the outbreak of the war 80 years ago. The plan for this museum is the very opposite. It allows only one perspective. It supports the national narrative. It presents only heroes and martyrs and it celebrates a cult of war. We are back again under the rule of tumors and age-old principles of monologic national memory, with the state constructing now its history as dictated by the emotions of pride and honor. To repeat uh, Peter Novik, in Poland or Hungary, national memories can't bear ambivalences and reduce uh, events to archetypes. Pride rules again, but in the third and fourth post-Holocaust generations, the emphasis is no longer on guilt or shame, but on responsibility and empathy. Those who prolong the language of guilt and shame are hysterically protecting the honor of the nation against better knowledge and conscience. Access to historical truth and education, however, are basic rights in a democratic state, and educated citizens do not weaken the nation, but strengthen it. In the next part of my presentation, I want to introduce you now <coughs> to an yet as yet unacknowledged pioneer of memory studies. I'm, sp I'm speaking of George Mossy, and we have one of his students, or better collaborators here in the audience, Jay Winter. An immigrant from Berlin and professor of history in Madison, Wisconsin. Here, here he is. In his book, Fallen Soldiers, Reshaping the Memory of the World Wars, from 1990, the word memory appears already prominently in the title, Although at the time it had never been, uh, it had neither been an analytic tool nor an established term of reference in 1990. Mosse, as I want to show, was not only a famous scholar of nation building and nationalism, but also an important memory scholar avant la lettre. His Jewish and gay focus turned him into an innovative cultural historian with a great sensibility for the gendered body implicit norms of respectability, and national rights and symbols. Instead of writing another history of the Great War, Mosse focused on the memory making of this war and how it was continued in the post-war period. Although the ceasefire <clears throat> on November 11th in 1918 was a huge relief, the war, he argued, 
was not so easily terminated. Mechanical warfare, the daily encounter with mass death, and the loss of 13 million soldiers, all this had a tremendous impact on the hearts and minds of the people and demanded new responses. A huge gap had opened up between the horror and the glory of the war, and it was the great challenge for all the nations involved to fill that gap by creating, by creating symbols that mask and transcend war, that mask and transcend death in war, masking death in war. In this situation, all nations adopted the memories of the veterans as true and legitimate who saw the war as containing positive elements and not those who rejected the war. As the emphasis was on consolation and justification and not on the general tragedy of the war, the nations constructed a myth, a myth <clears throat> which would draw the string the sting from <clears throat> the string uh, from death in war and emphasize the meaningfulness of the fighting and sacrifice. The result is <clears throat> of this memory making was what Mosse termed the myth of the war experience, the MWE. It displaced the reality of war experience and refashioned it as a sacred experience involving new saints, martyrs, places of worship, and a heritage to emulate. This sacralization of war went hand in hand with the sacralization of the nation. Mosse did not use the term myth to expose or to explode it as a lie. Deconstruction of the myth was the job of Erich Maria Remarque, Old Squired on the Western Front, later, 1929, and the post-war generation and international anti-war movement that Astrid Erl has so impressively retraced. Mosse, on the contrary, was interested in the circumstances and ways in which it was constructed and how it shaped human behavior and the self-image of nations. He wrote, it was the accounts of the volunteers which were most apt to become part of the national canon. And he concedes that this was only a small minority, but as other volunteers remained silent, it was the minority's poetry and prose which attracted attention. The European nations developed different versions of the myth. While the victorious, victorious nations France and Britain transformed it in the dominant emotion of mourning, in German politics, the myth was saturated with resentment and eventually became the medium to prolong the Great War into peacetime and into the next war. Here, the memory of the Great War was kidnapped by the NS state who raised its version of the MWE into its central ideology. Nationalism became national socialism, a manly faith steeled in war to use Moss's concise description. This furthered a new brutalization that invaded public life. The nascent democratic spirit was up against a radical mode of constant political mobilization. The emphasis on heroic action, the normative ideal of male manliness, and the vocabulary of friend against foe dominated more and more, leaving little space for the normalization of post-war life and a civil spirit. The vocabulary of political battle, the desire to utterly destroy the political enemy, and the way in which these adversaries were pictured, all seemed to continue the First World War mostly against a set of different internal foes. Without ever mentioning Carl Schmitt, Mosse aptly characterized his political style in the political climate and context from which his thinking emerged. For Mosse, it was the business of the historian to analyze how ideas are constructed to serve the purposes of a society and to show how these constructs gain influence, hold sway over collectives and individuals, and become tools of making history. His use of the term myth was not that of Roland Barthes, but much closer to that of anthropologist Bronislav Malinowski, who used the term for the stories 
we live by, stories that interpret and express our values and explain where we come from, who we are or what we want to be. There's not, nothing wrong with the myth as, with myth as such, but certainly with the way in which the myth of the war experience was turned into the state ideology of the militant Third Reich. At first, this MWE may sound rather far away from our contemporary problems. But, as I want to show, it is not history. <clears throat> it is still memory. There is still emotional pressure in the unresolved issues that are part and parcel of the dynamics of forgetting and remembering, and thus a seminal part of an ongoing battle over emotions and values in Europe. The MWE is key to a better understanding of how wars are ended or not ended. Mosse warned us, there are no full stops in history when suddenly everything changes. There are long continuities. With this wary and critical stance, he alerted us to one of the most important questions that historians can ask, namely, how are wars ended? And we may add, what is the role that remembering and forgetting play in this process? In Europe, the myth of the war experience was effectively ended after 1945 by forgetting it. Already in 1946, Winston Churchill made this very clear in a speech in Zurich, when he said, we must all turn our backs upon the horrors of the past and look to the future. We cannot afford to drag forward across the years to come hatreds and reven revenges which have sprung from the injuries of the past. If Europe is to be saved from infinite misery and indeed from final doom, there must be an act of faith in the European family and an act of oblivion against all the crimes and follies of the past. This strategy of forgetting draws a finishing line under the past and lets bygones be bygone. In Europe, it laid the ground for a new transnational cooperation and was gladly accepted by the Germans. Such a policy of forgetting has worked many times in history after civil wars when two parties <clears throat> were fighting in a more or less symmetrical power relation. When warfare, however, is accompanied by atrocities perpetrated against civilians and defenseless minorities, when, in other words, wars become genocidal, the policy of forgetting has a serious drawback because it supports the perpetrators and harms the victims. The forgetting policy worked in Germ Germany after 1945 for four decades, empowering the transnational union of a new Europe, but it did not bring the war to an end. The policy of forgetting ended itself in the 1980s and 1990s. Due to a generational change and the fall of the wall, a new era started that saw an overwhelming return of repressed and excluded memories that had been held at bay by the social, cultural and political frames constructed in the period of the Cold War. I know what I'm talking about because I grew up in this period. There were many ways in which the silenced past returned to European nations, cities, families in the 1980s and the 1990s. The Second World War was thus brought to an end twice, first after 1945 with a conscious collective act of forgetting and then 50 years later with a collective will to remember. But what about the First World War? It returned after 100 years, not as a repressed memory, but in the conscious format of a centenary commemoration. Public anniversaries mark particular dates and offer the chance to bring an historic event back into the present, not necessarily only for the mere continuation of the memory, but also for its reinspection and reinterpretation. This happened on a large scale in the commemoration period 2014 to 18, which brought the First World War back to European nations, an event 
that had been commemorated annually in some countries, while in others it had dropped completely from memory, school curricula, and public consciousness. While on every November 9, 11th, the day of the truth, truth, the French, the Belgians, and the British mourn and commemorate their war debt, the Germans, starts, Germans start their carnival season. President Francois Hollande's contribution to the commemoration year on this day, uh, 11th of 11, 2014, was an impressive gift called the Ring of Memory in the north of France near Arras. It is an outstanding monument, not only in terms of its large scale, but also in its design. The 500 brass plates of the huge cyclical structure list more than half a million fallen soldiers in the region, irrespective of their origins, regiments, or nations, in alphabetical order. This is a huge shift in the use and meaning of war monuments. It is a truly European monument in so far as it dedicates to all the dead, it is dedicated to all the dead and to shared mourning and memory <coughs> of the mutual slaughter. This monument abstains from the former rhetoric of honor and glory <coughs> and clearly brings the war to an end. We may, may perhaps even call it a monument to the death of the myth of the war experience. But while President Hollande opted out of a narrow transnational tradition of commemoration, David Cameron did the very opposite. When he presented his plans for the commemoration year in the Imperial War Museum in 2012, he opted out of the European commemorative network and strongly reinforced the British version of the MWE. In his truly national commemoration, he included the colonial troops of the glorious former empire. Cameron praised repeatedly the service and sacrifice of the fallen soldiers and promised to prolong their, project their memory into the future of another hundred years. Lest we forget, this British exceptionalism is also clearly visible in the continuing annual rites of November 11 in the United Kingdom a National <clears throat> Commemoration Day that is celebrated with growing ardor, judging from the size of its central symbol, the red poppy. What fell totally flat in Cameron's commemoration plans was a reference to the partners of the EU and the former allies. This emphatic affirm affirmation of national sovereignty for me was already a clear signal for of uh, British isolationism four years before the Brexit. While the national MWE was laid to rest in France to make pl place for a shared and more dialogical European memory, it continues fervently in the UK where such a shared memory is not yet in sight. Before I, before I come to an end, let me point in passing to other instances where the Second World War has not yet been ended in the hearts and minds of the people, but continues to exert pressure on the EU. <clears throat> in Italy, for instance, April 25 was a national anniversary day commemorating the end of the Second World War. On this day, in 1945, the Allies liberated Italy by putting an end to the fascist regime. This year, however, the defeat of the fascist forces was no longer a day to remember for Premier Matteo Salvini from the right-wing Lega. Ostentatiously disrespecting the commemoration date, Salvini complied <coughs> with a new or rather old trend in Italy that has rehabilitated Mussolini as a national hero and put him back on his pedestal in, a pu in public space. Co-Vice Premier Luigi Di Maio of the Five Stars Movement, however, objected to Salvini's provocation and confirmed that he stands behind those who liberated Italy, the resistors and the partisans. 
This dissent among the leaders of the state is a visible sign that the Second World War has not ended in this country. The eruptions of dissent and protest show that a shared dialogic narrative that acknowledges and accommodates the perspectives of both in, in a national frame is still missing. And there are other instances today in the EU where a war has not yet been mentally or emotionally ended. Spain is an obvious example where the unity of the nation is under double stress of political polarization and regional partition. These issues have their origin in the 20th century, in 20th century history, reaching back to the Civil War. The Pact of Silence in 1977 had been a pragmatic decision that enabled a successful and sustainable transition to democracy. But today there are also symptoms that this policy of forgetting is not a permanent solution and that the war is far from having been ended. The exhumation movement which started after 2000 was an obvious signal <clears throat> and of course Franco's massive monument in the Valley of the Fallen, which will be visited this week by many members of this conference, had been an attempt to end the war symbolically by sealing it with his stamp, but in doing so, he has not <clears throat> laid the memory of the past to rest, as we notice after 80 years, but instead he left future generations with a huge scar and a historical wound. It is obviously difficult to hold the nation together without some kind of consensus about seminal events in its history. Imagine, for instance, a Germany in which half of the population believes that erecting a wall in Berlin and Europe was a good thing. I come to my conclusion. In the 1980s, Mosse registered that the MWE as a whole seems to have passed into European history. But he also added, the future is open. If nationalism as a civic religion is once more in the ascendant, the myth will once again accompany it. For Mosse, war itself was the great brutalizer, so it followed for him that some of what has been called the civilizing process was undone under such pressure. Brutalizing and civilizing were our opposite tracks along which nations may aspire. We must not forget that many Europeans saw the First World War as a recipe for regeneration through violence. What was denounced as degenerate and effeminate culture had to be replaced by a strong ideal of heroic manliness. In civil times, these fits of megalotumia quickly lose their grip and are banished from the scene. But for how long? When Norbert Elias wrote about this topic, he spoke of the process of civilization. Civilization of civil civilizing is not a process, but a project, I would argue, and only humans themselves can drive this process according to their cultural values, programs, and continuous education. Nations are never brutal or civil per se, but only in relation to their cultural programs. Do they opt for tumultic pride or anti-tumultic self-civilizing dignity? Do they declare the nation, the collective, the state, the institution to be a church, to be sacred? Or do they place that sacredness rather in the individual? Reimagining the nation, as I wanted to show, is a pressing problem and a huge task, but it is also worthy of all of our attention. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Asman. We will not continue with the debate. First of all, I need to turn on your microphone, Please. if you allow me to do that. It should work. Yeah. Okay. 
many can't stand the heat, I guess. <laughs> so, thank you very much for. Thank you very much for the insights that you have given us, um, especially about this link between memory, identity, and emotions. And uh, from the point of view of Mosse, who was for me also pretty unknown. So thank you very much for that. Um, as, you've said, as you've said, there has been a sort of a gap, let's say, maybe also in the narration, especially of leftist and cosmopolitan approach towards the concept of, of nation. Um, so that the right-wing movements now could have plunged in there. And um, as we could see, they have gained a lot of strength and force lately. What I was wondering is, um, if, is this somehow, or probably it is linked also to this economical crisis we have experienced in 2008, because I think the rise of the right-wing, right-wing parties um, could be traced back maybe also to this date. Do you think? Um, we can, do you hear me already? Can you hear her? Yeah, no. Yeah, you can. No. Is, is, not is it not, yet? maybe it's not yeah. turned on. Let, let us check this once more. It should be. So Maybe you have to, to yeah, write this yeah, higher. Right. Let me see. Is it? Maybe here. It's, it's here. Should? Um, not yet connected. Should? No? Otherwise, we get the other microphone. Yeah, perhaps we, we take the other. Oh, you have to put this higher? Maybe higher. I just told to put it here. So I can okay. put it here. But yeah. yeah. So okay. Okay, I can also use it like this. Yeah. Certainly, the right wing parties have assembled, and there was always a part of them left. I mean, they were never gone completely. But it was amazing in Germany that at the moment when the Constitutional Court decided not to um, prohibit um, the um, Nazi party, the neo-Nazi party, because it was so irrelevant, <laughs> they didn't prohibit it. That was the moment when the new AfD party emerged, mm. you know, mm. which um, was um, uh, of a different order. And here I would argue <clears throat> financial um, distress is not really the topic of these people. That's mm -hmm. not what they make uh, votes, uh, what they gain votes on. It's, it's the immigrant. It's the mm. enemy. Uh, that, who destroys the M&E stereotype, the, um, <clears throat> the spreading this uh, anxiety that you are losing everything, you know? yes. not only the last penny, but also your homeland. This is much um, more effective in mm -hmm. terms of emotional impact. So I think mm -hmm. it is, it is uh, really the recent, mm -hmm. the recent crisis okay. Thank related you. to immigration. I would like to open the debate also to the audience. Um, do you have any questions, any comments? We have microphones here, so one is over there, then there's another one over there. Maybe the volunteers with the microphones, where are they? <laughs> otherwise, we can, otherwise we can take this one meanwhile. So I pass it on to you. That was, that was me, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you so much for, for the talk. Um, I am an architect from Mexico who works with cultural and collective memory and other concepts in order to better design memorials. And this notion about dialogic memory versus monologic memory actually informs very well the type of spaces that I am trying to create. And the example of the Ring of Remembrance in France is actually one I find to be heading in the right direction because it blurs the lines and allows um, better uh, to, to have a, a more critical approach to creating the own interpretations. So my question would be, uh, in regards to the design of memorials and, and also understanding that a lot of the alt-right movements are also weaponizing uh, the design of memorials to further their own interests, uh, what would be your thoughts in respect to the actual praxis of using these, the concept specifically of dialogic and monologic memory in regards to memorialization 
And also, uh, as a side note to that question, would you make a distinqu uh, distinction between uh, the approach of monumentalization or designing and building monuments versus creating memorials or the notion of counter monuments? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, can you really hear me? I think I speak. It doesn't, it doesn't really... But when I speak like this, it works, right? I'll do it this way. So, <clears throat> um, first of all, the distinction between monuments and memorials. I read an essay by a person, I think, from um, yeah, South, uh, Southern California, and uh, he made a very easy solution here, <laughs> promised one, offered one, that uh, monuments are bad memo uh, Mm. What was the other? Memorials. Memorials are good, yeah. The one is reflexive, the other is not and so forth. This is, of course, a, a distinction of our own making. We are creating the terms that we like and that we reuse and so forth, uh, but it, they may not really help us to understand deeper um, sometimes. <clears throat> but, of course, counter monument is something very different, and it is something that um, has, a, has a start in, in history. It, it started as um, the American critic um, <clears throat> James Young, <clears throat> who wrote the first book about them, two artists, three artists in Germany, started in the 80s and 90s. And it was amazing that the German intellectuals did not even notice, because monuments is not something that you even look at. But uh, in this case, um, it was a total reversal of the grammar of monuments. Um, and they became reflexive and in a way, <clears throat> uh, self-reflexive in, in such a way that they even uh, comment on their presence or disappearance and uh, have all kinds, they're not necessarily shocking, but they're evasive. They're much more difficult to hold on to. So they don't give you the illusion that you can really rely on them. They will do the job of remembering, you know, they will do it and we, we can re uh, uh, draw back. This is exactly what uh, Jochen Gertz's um, statement is. We can never for a long time invest our memory in a monument because it will not do the job for us. You know. This was the idea behind the counter monument and uh, that created a new trend. But of course all the other styles of monuments uh, go on and I don't see that um, the right-wing parties are interested in innovative uh, monuments, wherever one of them uh, appears in a German city, they make a big fuss. Two examples um, of two monuments, or also presentations of art, public art in public space in Dresden or in Kassel, where two migrants created these monuments, uh, which were the three buses from <coughs> Syria uh, put in a um, vertical position which had acted in one of the Syrian cities um, as a defense against snipers. And his idea was, I put it exactly opposite to the Frauenkirche in Dresden, this huge now European symbol, and show that these are two <coughs> cases of dis destroyed cities. And uh, in order to create a kind of bond or a kind of um, similarity so that the citizens can relate to another event in the past, present with their memory from the past. But this didn't work at all for the AfD, of course, they only said it's terrible, um, you are destroying the beauty of the city, take away this rubbish or trash and so forth. And a similar um, thing happened in Kassel where a monument was created. In this um, case, a vertic um, an obelisk, so not, nothing very <coughs> innovative about that shape. Innovative was the idea that an old um, symbol of pharaonic empire and European empires is now used to convey a um, very opposite me uh, message and the message is I was a stranger and you have given me a home. Um, uh, you were my host. So this uh, sentence from the <clears throat> chapter uh, from the Gospel of uh, Matthew was put on this and uh, it was <clears throat> considered to be an in um, unbearable um, provocation on the part of this um, 
party and it was, had to be dismantled. It's no longer in this uh, city space. It may be uh, resurrected at another place elsewhere. But these are examples that uh, in really monuments now, whether they have a very innovative shape or whether they are <clears throat> presenting themselves in, in a situation of, of conflict within the city, they are uh, extremely visible today and not, uh, no longer what um, Musil said about them, that nobody sees them, you know, because they're always um, frozen and immovable and nobody um, uh, see, uh, notices them anymore. I think that been further questions, one there and another over there. Yeah. So, who starts first? I was in the middle. Sure. I don't know. No? Then over there, there had been a question. Over there. Hmm. Yeah. Here? And, okay. Um, thank you for a really wonderful paper. Um, I, th I think I find your argument that we need to have a more nuanced analysis of different national histories and that World War II and World War I, we're finding out, has meant different, means different things to different nations and that in a part we are experiencing residues of that history in the present in different ways in different places. And my question is whether you have more concrete thoughts about where the left can intervene in a more effective way than it has been. Because I think what you're alluding to is that the post-national sentiment has only created more resentful and backfired mm -hmm. in some of these places. Is there a way that the left can intervene that will be more effective in your mind? Thank you, very important question. And indeed, we all have to think about that. One thing that came to my mind when I heard you speak was that uh, was the museum in Europe, uh, European Museum in Brussels. Perhaps um, if it stands there as a representative of, for European nations, it is in a way thoughtless, mindless, you know, to offer this particular message um, and disregarding the Eastern European experience altogether. So, um, the group of people, the, the masterminds who did it, of course, they had wonderful ideas, they were innovative, were praised by the media, but they may have left out a little, something up from the spectrum. And what I'm really talking about is uh, how can we become more um, <clears throat> thoughtful in this sense uh, by integrating um, different experiences and uh, also thinking about uh, the, the way in which we uh, <laughs> what, what is the appearance, uh, how do we, um, how are we perceived by others? I mean, the, the self-perception and the perception of others, of what we are saying. And sometimes there, there are just many misunderstandings involved here and what is actually lacking is more uh, communication. What I would like to come back to <laughs> is a state in which we move from the outright hatred polarization you know, situation of communication now in the societies that we're, where we end up right now, that we can move back two or three steps and come back to the situation in which we can still understand each other and each other's position. I think they have to be um, <coughs> acknowledged here, and the moment they are acknowledged, um, a lot of the, the heat, steam goes out of the argument. And so I think, um, <coughs> Uh, by, in, in terms of these self-reflections, we can translate it exactly in the direction that you are mentioning. How can we become more um, communicative in um, presenting this position by making it understandable to the other position and integrate what we have perhaps left out and forgotten, but which, of course, can be easily integrated. Thank you. Make it more inclusive in a way. You had a question? So, yeah. Thank you. That was such a wonderful and important talk. Um, and my question is, is somewhat related to uh, Michal's question. I mean, I think I agree with you, and I'm sure everybody here agrees with you, that we need to uh, make a turn toward a more serious consideration of the national and of national memory. And that, I think, a few years ago, a lot of us didn't, would have to admit we didn't see this coming in quite the same way. I think 
Most people would agree with that. I guess, would you not want to make a distinction, though, between the object of our study and the methodology? At one point, it seemed like you were kind of collapsing together national memory and methodological nationalism. But it seems to me that if we want to understand nationalism today, we still need to employ a methodology that goes beyond the national and is indeed transnational. And to some extent, that's what you were doing by moving so uh, deftly across different national contexts. But I'm also thinking about the nature of the nationalist movement today, which are in fact sort of transnational forms of nationalism. And they're indeed networks in all sorts of frightening ways. And so it seems like we have to balance both a greater attention to the national scale with a recognition that part of what is driving uh, the national is precisely various kinds of transnational forces. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, again, um, very inspiring question. Um, perhaps what we should do is not focus only on the nation, um, but also on uh, different levels because they, they all coexist uh, simultaneously. We have to start in the region, and uh, this is also why we have established a study group, and some of them are here today, um, which is called Memory in the City, because uh, this is the place actually, in, uh, especially in the case of migrants, where they actually <clears throat> immigrate into uh, because they don't live in Europe and they don't even live in the nation. They, everybody lives um, with his foot on the, on the ground and uh, in a, an inhabited space and that is always local. So the local uh, level is, is extremely important and um, um, the larger uh, context would be the region because the region also has its own identity and all um, <coughs> qualities that you can identify with, you don't have to go all the way up there. You can be satisfied with whatever context you have. You can start with the neighborhood, you can be happy in your region, you don't need to bother about what is about there. Uh, the emphasis on these abstract units like nation or even EU um, is difficult because it again leaves out so much lived experience, uh, the, the everyday experience and uh, it would be important to reconnect these levels and to show <clears throat> that um, uh, the, the, it is a special uh, sort of um, <clears throat> gratification or um, extra bonus to <clears throat> not only live on the level of nation but also to live, for instance, in Europe um, on, and, and uh, cherish the transnational uh, because it widens your <clears throat> possibility of mobility of thinking or interaction and also with this high dense uh, diversity in, in, in uh, <clears throat> contracted space it's also uh, such a European possibility so one can easily talk about all of these levels without <clears throat> leveling uh, one or the other you know because they work together and um, the big chance of, of, for me for Europe um, actually I never thought about Europe until this uh, crisis and now I've written a book called The um, European Dream in which I uh, focus on four <clears throat> lessons from history uh, that Europeans have learned and this for me is really a kind of extra bonus for the nation, ex uh, nations in order to domesticate them in the sense of civilizing them by uh, agreeing first of all upon these democratic principles which are learned from history and then to add their diversity and so forth and this is such a uh, fantastic arrangement and such, uh, such a fantastic heritage that I want to hold on to and I want to um, um, defend it against uh, uh, in this situation so this is how I came into into the subject um, and I think it can be better argued that this is also benefit you know, for others, it's so obvious. We have to defend and uh, argue, I think, and make these positive <clears throat> um, qualities more obvious to everybody in order to counter this constant emphasis on um, abstract threat, you know, the migrant, you know, and, and the, uh, all the African people are coming and making this continent black and nobody <clears throat> white will be around us. So these are paranoia uh, ideas which have to be countered very <coughs> um, patiently and uh, in detail um, every day. Yeah. Okay, before we continue here, I would like to read one of the comments from the app. And the question here is, how can perpetrator nations like Germany perform national pride without contributing to right-wing nationalism rhetoric? A very good point. Um, Thank you for the question. Um, 
I didn't get around to answering all the questions that I asked in my lecture, but this was one, and now you asked me, thank you. <laughs> Actually, our president in, in Germany has made the point we cannot just uh, um, focus on, <clears throat> uh, on this, uh, the, the trauma of the Holocaust, and this cannot be the, the, the source of identification and so forth, especially not for migrants and, and so forth. We need to offer <clears throat> positive um, identification potentials, and for him this is the history of democracy in Germany. I think I, I understand what he wants, to, what, what he's striving at, and he's uh, celebrating Weimar Republic, and he's doing all of this, but as I s said, um, George, reading George Mosse, we can read how brittle this um, fragile, this democracy was after the First World War. So I don't think it work so easily by going back to um, this political history to convince everybody that we have a strong reason of pride. Uh, I must say I feel uh, a big debt uh, to the United States um, because I think without um, re-education, you know, um, t totally transforming the course of ideas in Germany after the Second World War and also with the Nuremberg trials, I mean, they in a way gave us uh, what um, the Germans never really um, managed to um, establish and preserve for themselves. So this uh, deficiency he wants to you know, make up for, I understand this, but one can also think a little bit differently. Of course, there are so many things to be uh, happy or glad about, them culturally, culture-wise or uh, landscape-wise or this or that but also the idea that um, transforming this history into something, uh, into a sort of a building block not only, but a, a foundation for a democratic spirit is also something that is, a, is an achievement that ca one can at least <clears throat> um, think of as, uh, well, Germany uh, won the respect actually as a nation because of this, therefore one can also argue um, that, what, that Germany was respected uh, for exactly this <clears throat> form of dealing with its history. And there's a book um, appearing this year by Susan Lehman. Uh, the title is Learning from the Germans. So I don't no longer associate this status of perpetrator nation with um, the guilt conscious. As I said, the term guilt is very um, problematic. One should not invoke it all of the time because guilt immediately um, works into the hands of the right because they then can reject it. So I think it is also a kind of um, um, proxy um, uh, argument or battle that is going on here. We should really focus on uh, achievements and then also associate them with a kind of um, <clears throat> sense of identification and um, something that we can build on. Mm -hmm. There was. First this question, then over here. Okay. For him, yeah. Thank you very much, Elida. Uh, I want to strike two positive chords. Um, the first is that what uh, Mossi was a transnational historian, and he presented a model of the need to reconceptualize history and memory, because he put memory back into the history uh, of the First World War and its aftermath in a way that makes it impossible to do what Halbachs did, which is to say there's history here and memory there. But one of the tasks, I think, of this uh, association is to rethink that, is, that, that relationship. Uh, the other positive point I, I'd like to add is that the, uh, the statistics are not in, but there is overwhelming evidence that the vast majority of commemorative plans, activities, events were on the local level and not the national level. And here we go back to Halbachs, because he never meant collective memory to be the state. He meant it to be a collective. And the collectives on the local never level now have the internet where they can look up the lives of their great uncle who was in the First World War or their aunt who was in a hospital. And this is, has uh, made it extraordinarily fertile in Germany at the local level, in France, in Britain. At the local level, we sh we, I think we, we underestimate the extent to which the local, uh, the identification of what is the nation is actually the neighborhood, the, the hills, um, the, str the, the stream, the, what the French call le petit pays, 
that which we live is what people think about the nation. If I could just add this one anecdote. Uh, once a, um, a British soldier on the Western Front was asked by a journalist, was he fighting for the empire? And he said yes, and he came out of the Manchester Guardian the next day. And his friends asked him following it, what in the world did you mean? And he said, I'm fighting for the Empire Music Hall in Hackney. Uh, the, local, the local culture that he thought and believed was, and I'm, this is what the commemoration of the First World War showed, that people on the local level now have the tools to write their own history. Our town, our village, our school, and it's happening all over the world, which makes the internet a transnational instrument as indeed it has to be. Well, thank you very much for elaborating on this important point and also bringing in the internet as a space where that happens. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Osman, for your talk. And I was reading a bit some keywords that I wrote on my notebook during your presentation, like homeland, emotion, return to a place, reimagination, nationalistic narratives, and other word come to my mind, that is nostalgia. So I was wondering, there is a role, if, if there is a role, of nostalgia in the, these nationalistic narratives that are now in uh, Europe in general. Thank you. Um, definitely, is there a place for nostalgia? Because it is so human, why we cannot uh, um, just um, say that this is not correct or whatever, we should um, forget about it. We cannot forget about it. It's very important, uh, especially in, in memory. But I think there is a really very interesting work already done in memory studies on nostalgia. I think of Svetlana Boyen, who, who, uh, or um, uh, Leo Spitzer, who uses the term critical nostalgia, which I also like because very often it is a kind of nothing else but a kind of counter memory. We already have the term in our discussion. So sometimes the same thing comes back with a new name and we only have to take off the code and to recognize the person. So it's, in this case, it's very similar. It can be a counter memory. It, it can preserve something that is valuable. It can be another layer, another dimension of experience that is meaningful and that can also be passed on. So um, I don't see what is wrong with it. The, the pro uh, problem could be that uh, nostalgia becomes a kind of fake reality that is then um, covering up uh, the problems of the current society and you, you are only uh, living in this fake world and so forth. So it can also destroy your sense for reality or possibility of action, but um, in general we have to look at it um, as a very human mm -hmm. possibility. Okay, then I would say you can ask your question, then I would read another one from the channel, then yours and another one from the channel, and I think you also had one, yeah? Okay. Right, Stefan Berger, Ruhr Universität Bochum. Um, thank you very much, Elida, uh, for uh, here. <laughs> here in the middle. <laughs> Thanks, Elida, for a very inspiring uh, talk. I wanted to come back to the question that was asked quite early on about, you know, what the left can do to counter uh, this uh, form of antagonistic memory that uh, the right has been. Uh, so successfully mobilizing over recent years. Um, and I was wondering, you didn't mention in your talk uh, agonistic memory, um, but if we're thinking also in uh, the journal memory studies, the uh, article by Hans Lauger Hansen and Anna Cento Bull on agonistic memory, I mean, this is an attempt, uh, a deliberately left-wing attempt uh, to kind of try and mobilize a memory that perhaps is more effective than the cosmopolitan forms of memory that we have seen over recent years in trying to counter the kind of antagonistic mobilization of memory that we have been seeing over uh, recent years. So my question uh, to you would be, uh, what do you make of this uh, agonistic memory, which obviously harks back problematically uh, through Chantal Mouffe to uh, Karl Schmidt, uh, but I think maybe we uh, don't necessarily uh, have to see Carl Schmidt and immediately throw everything uh, out of the window uh, yeah. again. So uh, especially as these forms of agonistic memory seem to play a lot with 
emotion and bringing emotions uh, back in in a way that perhaps can counter uh, the right-wing mobilization of emotion more than cosmopolitan <laughs> forms of memory. Mm -hmm. And maybe just one aside to the last comment on nostalgia, um, Laura Jane Smith from Heritage Study has argued that nostalgia is an important resource for the left in order to counter uh, the neoliberal imagination of deindustrialization in those areas undergoing deindustrialization. So I see nostalgia also as a resource of the left, not necessarily only of uh, the right. Mm -hmm. Okay, and thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I would um, like to uh, repeat repeat what I said in, in, in the following way, I just don't be afraid of the nation. I, I just want to tackle a complex of the left and that has to do with being very timid um, when it comes to the nation. So why, why be so afraid? Uh, I had actually um, a very, for me, uh, interesting controversy with Robert Menasse at the beginning of this year who um, was um, advocating to get rid of the nation from his very leftist point and create a Europe only of uh, Europe based on uh, regions. Yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, forget about this nation. And um, <clears throat> for me, obviously, I am again confronted with um, intellectual and writer and artist who is uh, in a state of heightened anxiety when he hears the word nation. And I also see this in the uh, academ academic discourses um, at the university where I'm you know, moving. It's very, very similar everywhere. And then I ask myself, but as I said, the nation does not exist in a void. It exists in states, and the states have different political systems. Why don't we talk about these systems, uh, these uh, structures? And um, what we have to save is perhaps not the nation, but the state in which a nation can exist. That's the point. And when we talk about this, we know that there are liberal nations and there are, there are nations <clears throat> that went wild and became um, fatally destructive, definitely. But as we know this, um, we don't have a chance just to say that we have to abolish the nation per se. Uh, we have much, much reason to <clears throat> Uh, work against exactly these trends because we now know what it means to save a nation. That's, that's the point. I'm not so interested to, uh, in, into more theoretical antagonistic uh, patterns. We, I think we are already in a situation of, of polarized discourse and more antagonism um, is perhaps not very <coughs> um, con congenial to my own uh, character, which is a little bit more uh, conciliatory um, <clears throat> and, and not so at, um, antagonistic. As I said, I'm more interested in persuading and talking and uh, communicating than in creating uh, <clears throat> uh, symbols and signs uh, of uh, confrontation. So um, what I dislike is uh, any movement in, in the direction of demonization or threat or a total uh, version, you know, all of these extreme um, um, emotions, they are everywhere. You, you see them everywhere. And I, I, what I want to do is, you know, to um, temper these uh, very strong and antagonistic or agonistic forces. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I would read another question from the channel. It says, it, uh, it is a fact that while it seems often to be forgotten, Austria is also a successor of a state of the Third Reich. It is also a fact that right-wing parties had an easier way into the Austrian political system again with the FPÖ coming into parliament more than a decade before the AfD in Germany. Do you see a correlation between public Holocaust memory and the formation dynamic of right-wing parties? Yeah, well, there's a big difference between Austria and um, Germany because Austria, as I showed you on this chart, enjoyed the status of the neutral state uh, and victim state, um, they created a successful myth of their nation that they were Hitler's first victim, you know, with the Anschluss. So Austria was Hitler's first victim, and therefore they did not have to do anything in terms of working through their own history. Mm. They are only now getting, last year it was opened in November, um, <clears throat> uh, 100 years after the birth of the Republic of Austria, the first republic, 
the first house of history in Austria. First house, house of history. Uh, the, <clears throat> the inhabitants of this country don't have a regular education about their history. There is no 68th movement in Austria. That nobody asked their fathers. They were all under the cover and com comfortable blanket of being neutral. There was no uh, discussion about all of this. And therefore, then nobody cared that there were many, many groups, especially in Kärnten and in Salzburg, uh, where families' networks just continued the way they were during the, the uh, collaboration with, with the, uh, Germany. So they continued their ways of thinking, their education, their singing, uh, all the rights, mm -hmm. uh, and transmitted it to the next, uh, the next generation. So here we have a total continuity you know, um, of thinking, and it's not only that it's maybe 10 years or longer or what, mm -hmm. it is just dis undisrupted uh, mm -hmm. in, in Austria, and it is uh, now becoming obvious uh, now to a larger um, <clears throat> perspective that um, there was no process of working through uh, within the population. So I, I just gave you a, a couple of examples. Uh, this does not mean that um, in Austria there is not a very, very strong and committed civil society. If you go into the internet, you just uh, Google erinnern.at, uh, remember AT for Austria, and they are extremely <coughs> resourceful, active, and uh, inspirational. And um, Vienna is also a, a city that is fantastic in, in this respect. But um, in the wider countries, um, there is sometimes very little uh, of this to be found, and um, therefore the, the situation is really different in Austria. Thank you for the question. Yeah, uh, well, uh, thank you very much for, for your uh, presentation and your lecture. So my question would be, uh, could you draw some, uh, well, I would say negative scenarios in case uh, in different European countries, uh, governments uh, still continue to stress the ethnic role of the, for the nation, so probably ignoring or dismissing the idea of common citizenship. So in, in my country, in Latvia, we are still very much under the spell of ethnicity, which was forbidden during the Soviet period. So there are almost no uh, offers for other groups, also migrants who are Russian speaking, to join the nation because it's strictly ethnic. So what, and, and in many cases, politicians seems that they just ignore the risk for not belonging to the nation. So what would be, so to say, negative scenarios if this idea perpetuates? Thanks. I think there is a possibility, and, and time is working for us here, because a pure ethnicity is very difficult to um, uphold. Uh, you have to really <clears throat> um, police people, um, put them into clear borders, and uh, let them not move around. But Otherwise, uh, what you have now, um, if you think about <clears throat> any group of us who, who would um, uh, start to identify himself, telling where his or her family comes from and how many different <clears throat> cultures and ethnicities and maybe um, our share of uh, each and everyone's heritage here, uh, the more we emphasize this um, diversity in, the, in every individual, um, the less, uh, uh, the more bizarre or um, curious or um, exceptional uh, is, of course, a pure ethnicity, and the more normal and the more um, yeah, general that becomes the other possibility. So um, I think it already when we uh, speak of, um, uh, of Europe and um, now the last two generations, there is the obvious situation that the purity of descent is something that uh, is being uh, <clears throat> yeah, um, overwritten very clear, very slow, uh, very quickly. And to hang on to it uh, seems more like a very nostalgic, um, perhaps also very unrealistic uh, movement. So, <clears throat> are you? Content with this? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have two more from the channel here, and as I can see, four more here from the audience. Uh, that is okay, and then maybe we can be a bit short. Okay, the, the one I will read from, from the channel first. Okay, 
um, it's more a comment. It's a reaction to the case of memory politics in Poland. In Poland, the ruling party uses the emotions of shame and pride in their rhetoric to channel both individual experiences of economic, of economic shame and collective experiences of cultural shame of their electorate. Individual and collective dimensions of emotions are interconnected. Hence, individual timus and collective national emotion are not discordant but entangled. Yeah, <clears throat> well, there are new versions uh, of emotions. Actually, this would be another lecture to think about which emotions are coming to the fore right now. When we spoke about guilt <clears throat> and perpetrators, I think these were emotions that are not really um, the emotions that we are having right now. Right now, we have new forms of resentment, and they have to do with um, uh, humiliation. And the humiliation is no longer the humiliation that Avishai Magali thought about when he said, um, when he spoke about a decent society and said, uh, a decent society is a non-humiliating society. Um, they generate humiliation themselves by looking at the way they are treated and they find that they are not treated well enough. And uh, for instance, when I think of some Eastern European intellectuals, um, Ivan Kastev, for instance, who, said, who says um, uh, people in Bulgaria, um, are, for instance, are under the um, impact or the, uh, the uh, uncomfortable um, imperative of, an, uh, of an imperative to, to repeat or to, to um, he calls it Nachahmungsimperative, to copy. Yeah. They have to copy what the West does. They want to be their own <coughs> uh, originals. They don't want to be copies. And, and therefore, they are already humiliated by the idea that the West is doing things that they expect them to do. So now these emotions are happening on a much uh, more sophisticated level and much more refined, or not necessarily refined, but more, much um, more finely grained uh, level. And, uh, but they can also immediately <clears throat> create uh, what in German is called Stimmungen. Uh, Stimmung would be um, atmospheres or uh, a, a collective um, spirit that detests things. So resentment uh, has many, many variations right now, and I think resentment um, next to hate are now the most prominent emotions that we have to uh, deal with. Mm -hmm. Hello? Is it good? Yeah. Okay. Um, I am going to take on the invitation of having non-European perspectives on this issue. Here I am. Um, so I'm speaking from a Latin American perspective in the shadows of the United States, but also from New Zealand where I work, which is part of the Commonwealth. So I wonder about basically to what extent it would be also useful to expand the memory process to before the, the wars, because Latin America is the home of a lot of European immigration, from Italy, from Germany, Croatia, etc. And uh, of course, there has been a synergy between Latin America and Europe because of that aspect. Um, but also the role of neoliberalism that was mentioned before, and corporate interests who are intervening directly in the state agendas, so it's the immigration, but it's also the role of economics and corporatization. I also wonder to what extent Europe is still too attached to the United States. I have the impression that the Marshall Plan created an alliance there and sense of loyalty that in some ways have diminished European independence in the international fora. And the last point is about Trump and in what way Trump has normalized the hatred speech and nationalism as well. Okay, um, let me just... Uh I'm kind of thinking, but maybe uh, this is just um, a private reflection on in which way memories can <clears throat> be useful or a yeah, uh, resource for uh, bringing wars to an end. This is um, and because you mentioned <clears throat> Uh, the Marshall Plan again, it comes up here. And um, one of the ways in which memory can also work is to remain a sense of gratitude. 
uh, to retain a sense of gratitude. And um, because if you forget what the other did for you, then you cannot be grateful. So if you forget what you promised, you cannot keep the promise. So memory is very important in these very basic acts. But um, as you <laughs> rightly said, um, Europe is no longer in this particular um, position right now. Can you raise your hand so I know where to speak to? Ah, uh, here, yeah, okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's so confusing. Yeah, but um, it is, uh, right, geopolitical transformations have gone so deep. Uh, and what is also <clears throat> over is this concept of the West. Um, it became very clear to me when I thought about this, um, and I come back to the other question, previous question, also the entanglement of collective and individual. Of course, the individual is implicated because uh, it's always the, the collective offer of an emotion is an uh, offer and I can integrate it, I can absorb it, I can uh, impersonate it. Um, so it, it always, <clears throat> it, it, um, it is contagious, of course, it goes uh, all ways. And this is how it creates um, Stimmungen, you know, the, the se collective sense of embitterment and so forth. And in this case, I thought about the West. The West is no longer a concept that is politically valid because it used to be based on modernization th um, theory and also a transatlantic uh, uh, unity. And this transatlantic unity <clears throat> is no longer uh, holding, it fell apart. And uh, now, now Europe has to find its own you know, um, course where it is steering. But this is also a, a great chance, really, because it can reconsider and um, uh, reconnect, of course, also, and, and um, um, consider its own history in a larger uh, perspective. I put, at, as, at the last uh, instance, I put also the form of the, the, the question of colonial memory in, um, in Europe. This is a level that had been totally um, covered as long as we, uh, Europe was in a Western uh, connection and everything was geared towards uh, the future. And um, <clears throat> that, uh, now the, the situation is quite different. And I think it's, it's really interesting to see how the changes in political constellations uh, also um, set free new forms of memory, because memories can come up or cannot come up uh, according to political alliances. And here now I think it is a new historical moment for colonial memory to surface uh, after this strong alliance as, with the, as the West um, has uh, sort of uh, broken apart. Okay, there was one more on the channel and two here, so I would uh, propose that we put them all together. Maybe then you can give a brief answer to that because it's very hot inside here. <laughs> and um, yeah, I don't want anybody to faint. <laughs> so the one from the channel, related to Sandra Kohler's question above, I'm thinking about the perpetrator nations. How can their citizens negotiate historical shame and the national pride in the present? I'm thinking about the youth in Japan many of whom feel they don't like their leaders, apologizing now for the events of World War II. This is one question. Then there was one up there. Um, do we have the microphone? Do we have the microphone? The microphone, do we have it? Can you, can you please get, yeah, from there to there? <laughs> Shall I ask my question? Ah. Ask a question and then we... we Thank we you. Yeah. Thank you at last. Um, because my question was precisely going to be about what you call colonial memory. Because there's a problem of configuring Europeanness uh, internal to itself or through a relationship with the United States and occluding the extent to which European societies were made in their colonies. And we have very important projects underway, such as the International Museum of British Colonialism and the digital, muse the digital project that documents all the sites of atrocities in Australia mm -hmm. right up to the 1940s and the 1950s. So, but when some European societies 
do what they call a non-European project, such as the Humboldt Forum in Germany, in Berlin. That is primarily a project of making Germany European, <laughs> when its Europeanness is uncertain because it is partly communist. It's, it is not actually part of the West, and so you find this discourse of the West particularly strong in Germany. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what are the implications of recognizing colonial history in a way that dislodges the concept of Europe and the concept of the West? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then the one with the, con la camiseta rosa, que tiene las gafas en la mano. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Asman. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Can I speak in Spanish? Okay. Uh, okay. I will try to translate. Por favor. Yeah. It's, it's better for me. Eh, eh, soy profesor de escrituras de la memoria. Eh, señor Asman, quisiera eh, hacerle do, dos preguntas de, de reflexión sobre su eh, admirable trabajo. Eh, en primer lugar, sobre el concepto de memoria dialógica, a mi entender, debía conducir a una memoria común europea y seguramente de la propia eh, humanidad. Eh, ¿Cuál es la posición respecto al victimario? Eh, ¿Se puede dialogar con el victimario? ¿Se puede dialogar con quien hoy eh, alardea de un neofascismo eh, imperante en esferas de países democráticos, de naciones de pasado y presente democráticos? Y en segundo lugar, eh, no es precisa una autocrítica en nuestros propios estudios de la memoria. Me explico con dos ejemplos, como usted hacía, eh, referenciales. Eh, en primer lugar, afirmamos una resignificación, una reimaginación, decía usted en el final de, de la conferencia, y esta no es posible, a mi entender, sin un planteamiento de una razón simbólica que necesite al modo de los viejos ilustrados y lógicamente con el cambio de, que se produce en el siglo XXI de una crítica de la razón simbólica. No se puede al mismo tiempo afirmar la exclusión de la emoción y al mismo tiempo afirmar nuestra defección sobre ello. No se puede afirmar al mismo tiempo eh, en los peligros del empoderamiento de la identidad y contribuir nosotros con algunos estudios sobre el empoderamiento de ese tipo de identidades. En este sentido, ¿cuál es nuestro eh, nuestra, eh, reto, desafío, en el corto y medio plazo, eh, colectivamente? Gracias, profesor. Okay, I will try to translate as, okay. as good as I can. <laughs> I'm not an interpreter. Well, he, he, the first um, part of his question was related to a memory and how it can be dialogical. Um, what is the position towards uh, victims and how can be there a dialogue um, to, to, with the history also to integrate uh, the history and veneration of the victims. And the second... Perpetrators. Okay, because the victims are okay. hmm. okay, no yeah, problem. No. Yeah. And um, the second part was more about how do uh, memory studies also have to be self-critical. Um, and yeah, with our own field of study. Um, openly spoken, because of the movement I didn't get part of it. Um, but he was talking about like the resignification um, of like old concepts and um, how we. I openly spoke on. I missed that part. Uh, but yeah, like how we can be more self-critical. But I don't know exactly with what because it was so noisy that I didn't understand part of. If the others have. Okay, I will start with the first question, Japan. Thank you uh, for this question. And also telling us something about uh, the second generation or third generation, soon of also fourth generations, who have problems with the uh, emotional code in, in Japan. Um, what I find helpful is the connection of 
uh, this distinction of two, two terms here and connecting with them with their pairs. So for me, shame and honor belong together and guilt and responsibility. If you think about <coughs> um, the crimes in history uh, in terms of shame and honor, you don't want to touch them, you cannot talk about them. Uh, they seal the, the mouth and, uh, in, because you lose your honor. Um, when you talk about them in terms of guilt, there's something to uh, be done about it, something that makes you active again. You can take responsibility. And this is exactly what the second generation can do and the third generation. They can take responsibility and they can <clears throat> do exactly what the other generations were unable to do or did not do historically, namely create empathy and respond, take over responsibility. So, so I see here um, possibilities in the um, transmission from the first to the second and third uh, generation. Um, and they go along the line of either you focus on shame or you focus on guilt. Um, the second question has to do with uh, this new form of Europeanness. Very important what you said. Um, I think there are two, again, two concepts that help me to understand where we are now. We have for a long time talked about post-colonial states, but now we start to talk about post-imperial nations. And this is a different discourse. We, have, we don't yet have the, the pattern for it, but it is exactly what is now, uh, has to be opened now. We talk about post-imperial nations. And Germany absolutely is not, um, an exceptional state here. It's a, a part of these uh, post-imperial nations and mm. even uh, it is related to the first genocide in the 20th century uh, which uh, was perpetrated in Namibia with the Herero and Nama. So um, <clears throat> it is um, part of the history that again had been covered up for a long time by focusing on one um, memory uh, excessively and exclusively, and the problem is that uh, focusing on one memory always elides other memories. It's like an eclipsing of uh, it, and you always ha uh, only have part of it, and the point is to make it more exclusive, it more oh. inclusive, to expand it, and to create room for uh, more historical <laughs> truths, and, um, <clears throat> and also <clears throat> knowledge. Uh, on the level of the, of the society about this. And this is exactly what the uh, Humboldt Forum uh, is there. It is an imperative. It was, uh, interestingly enough, uh, it was created uh, as a castle, you know, as a castle. We want to have some glorious Prussian uh, history back, and we put it back into our center of our city, but uh, without thinking, you know, like an... <clears throat> Uh, like a Freudian return of the repressed, you know, comes the Humboldt Forum right in the middle of the capital, in the middle of the castle, and now we have this uh, history that falls on our feet. And uh, this, I think, is a, is a fantastic symbolic um, act to enter, uh, uh, open up a new door and enter a new phase uh, to become one of the post-imperial um, nations that then um, enter into, as we already said, new uh, relations uh, also globally through the economies. Mm -hmm. uh, the last uh, question, I hope that we can um, talk uh, to each other individually. Mm -hmm. um, you speak uh, um, about the difficulty of integrating perpetrators and creating a dialogue with them. That is a huge problem. The director uh, of the um, an S Doku Zentrum in Munich, for instance, he uses two words <laughs> in German. He uses one word to remember the victims and one word to remember the perpetrators. And this particular museum or document center is only for the per perpetrators and he actually uses a different language. And in this can context, um, it has to do with uh, acknowledging, with publicizing, with making known, you know, the, the society has to know about this and uh, make it part of their knowledge, uh, common knowledge that this was the case and this happened. Uh, it is, of course, much easier when this generation is no longer around, you know, which is the case in Germany. Now, of course, all these tales can be told, um, but as long as they're protected by families and so forth, it's, it's uh, more, much more difficult, and I think we have to think about exactly your issues here. 
Now, when I look into the audience, I'm very happy that we put the fans inside the welcome kits because it's really necessary here. <laughs> but I think it's a good time now to try to solidify again, yeah, a little bit. Um, and I thank you very much for all your questions and also thank you very much to you to have answered them so patiently. Continue for hours, but maybe having a glass of wine or something or outside. <laughs> Vielen herzlichen Dank. Ja, <lacht> das ist wirklich.